let's just get started. We'll talk with uh, about the modern state of journalism. Of course, most of you know, we hosted Marjorie Taylor Greene. Within not even 24 hours, we were swatted. Then we hosted, I think, just just like the next show, I think after that was Micro, mm -hmm. and we were slammed by a DDoS attack, which exceeded a gigabit, which for those aren't familiar, I'm actually fairly surprised that was able to happen. It was like a several gigabit international botnet that attacked us. And so the work we do just on a talk show is, it's dangerous, especially for the establishment, for powerful interests. And of course, the work that all of you guys do is extremely dangerous, and thus, Let's just talk about what happened with you, James. You have a development on the, the FBI raid on your headquarters and you? That's right. Uh, well, the federal judge in New York, and thank you again for having me. Um, a lot has happened since I last saw you, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've been raided. raided by the you, <laughs> you, you got swapped people. I get raided by the FBI, and, um, and, I, and I'm proud to sit next, here next to my friend Andy No. Uh, Andy is featured in the first chapter of this book, which the first chapter is called Suffering. Mm. It's called Suffering. The book American Muckraker. Yes, he, he's been through some physical violence. Um, I've been through a different type of violence directed at us through, from the state. Um, 10 to 12 FBI agents showed up at my house in November mm -hmm. and took my phones. Um, and we'll talk more about that here. But um, And they did that not despite the fact that we're doing journalists, but because we're doing journal journalism. And that's how far it's gotten. So... Um, a federal judge in New York, the Southern District of New York, also known as the Sovereign District of New York, because they're quite autonomous with their decision making, uh, ordered the FBI to stop doing that and then ordered what's called a special master to oversee the FBI, which is very rare. You can count on one hand how often that happens. The federal judge citing journalistic privilege, Tim, and this federal judge was not a Trump appointee. It was an Obama appointed federal wow. judge. And that what was amazing to me when that happened was that the ACLU defended us, the Reporters Committee defended us, the Society mm -hmm. of Professional Journalists defended us, which showed me there still is this very narrow consensus in this country between left and right. Um, so the, the, this, today uh, we filed a motion that the U.S. attorneys are argued that we should pay for this special matter. I think we have some wind coming in. Yeah, there, you can you know? hear it whistling. Whistling. Maybe that's a sign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The ominous wind, right as we begin talking about ominous your... <laughs> wind in the background. That's what that was. I don't like that. The soundtrack of our life. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, so, the U.S. attorneys. Bottom line is the U.S. attorneys argued before the judge, and before they assigned the special master, the U.S. attorney said, "Well, Your Honor, James O'Keefe is not a journalist." The judge asked why, and the U.S. attorneys, the prosecutor said, "Well, Your Honor, James O'Keefe does not get permission, consent." from the people that he reports on. It's non-consensual reporting and recording. Wait, what the hell? Which is such an <laughs> right? That's like a two plus two equals five, but this is what they wrote in the motion. The judge rejected that argument, thank God. There still is some sanity in New York and, and appointed this, this special master. But now the US attorneys are saying, we should pay, the, the journalists should pay, the government. This is extraordinary. We, we should just let uh, um, the people of America know that at the New York Times, before they cover any story about, say, James, they call him and get permission first. Oh, or before yes, they yes. release, you know, Donald Trump's tax records or his mm -hmm. personal information, they, of course, get consent from the people that they're reporting on all the time. You know, it's standard protocol. And definitely before someone gets doxxed, like when the Obviously. New York Times uh, tried to dox Tucker Carlson, they, of course, got permission first. Or when CNN goes after grandmas who are posting on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, yeah. They definitely get permission from those grandmas. So this is an extraordinary, <laughs> this is an extraordinary, I guess, Rubicon that we've not crossed yet. Now they're starting to put people in handcuffs for doing stories they don't want done. Right. Yeah, it's not enough to just censor the stories on social media. Now they yes. want to come after people for actually just doing the stories in the first place. I wonder what would have happened um, to the New York Post if these kinds of rules were in place last year. Mm -hmm. Well, that, and then the doing. New York Times, and you did you did a few shows on this since I last saw you. The New York Times published my attorney-client privilege that's, documents. That, that's a whole and new level in, of insane. And we, we could talk, we do a whole show on that. But, but what's fascinating is that the New York Times actually did an article saying it's a crime to transport stolen documents across state lines. State well, lines. I, well, I guess that, no, that's, that's actually what they the article their says. State lines. The New York Times says it's a crime to transport stolen, which means that every report at the New York Times should be in jail. Yeah. Because that's Especially called... Especially the reporting they did on you. Mm. And, I mean, maybe they should be raided by the FBI for publishing my attorney-client privilege documents. But but look at where the New York Times has gone. They've lit, they, they're they not adversarial journalists. When they say that stuff, it's because they're the mask is off. The New York Times is a mouthpiece of the state or, or of some kind of establishment elitist 
power. They have a symbiotic relationship with the FBI and Pfizer. And that's ironic, isn't it? Mm. We, we, who was it who was on who was saying that uh, the New York Times, was Badia Unger Sagan, that mm -hmm. the New York Times has effectively just decided their audience is the upscale, upper class, urban liberal, and they don't care about anybody else anymore. So that's just what they're going to pander to. I think that's exactly right. You can see in the way that their stories are written that that's what they're trying to do. I mean, if you read their stories in an NPR voice, it's exactly the same <laughs> as <laughs> listening <laughs> to NPR. Right. <laughs>